right. And then we have to think about resolutions. Um, and one thought that many people are moving toward is, well, I mean, it's, it's I think, rather uh, basic in geography, is what, uh, what is the relationship between the resolution of your environmental data and um, the estimated um, accuracy of the current point? So if you have a current point that are maybe, you know, realistically plus or minus 10 kilometers, does it make sense to make a model with um, grids of climate that have been interpolated down to one kilometer squares? Right? So I think geographers in general would say you shouldn't use uh, fine climate layers uh, unless your current points also uh, are very certain to have to be in that extent. Okay, so spatial autocorrelation in general with uh, both well, with the current record is a problem. We can see that with evaluation, but this is some is a place where actually spatial autocorrelation can be our friend. So if maybe you don't have perfect perfect georeferences and maybe your point doesn't fall into this uh, square in reality, but it really falls in the one next door, what are you going to argue to the editor and the reviewer? They say, oh, your um, occurrence points aren't good enough for using that resolution of climate data. Unless you want to redo it all, what are you going to say? Right. Yes. So even if you're not being exactly the correct pixel, it's likely that the adjacent pixel will be rather similar. So it seems reasonable to interpret that it may not have a very large effect. But, but you can't really show that without doing other things. Okay, so spatial autocorrelation can be your friend. Um, but, but think about how big a mismatch there is between the uh, spatial quality of your occurrence data and the spatial quality of your environmental data. Okay. So we've talked about uncertainty. Here's another example of, uh, there's some interesting things, uh, like isothermality. Okay, then we move into mobile circulation models, uh, which can create estimates of current climate, but they're also used for estimates of future climate. And what else? What other, uh, what other uses of CDM? We grow the stuff. Anybody doing phylogeography? Yeah, so they take the GCMs, they run them backwards and estimate what the conditions could have been at last spatial maximum, for example. So, what advantage do we have in uh, reconstructing past climate that we don't have when we're estimating future climate? Okay, what, what can you say? Yes, if you have what kind of data in the past, and sometimes we do, what all sorts of Yes, fossils, right? Okay, so sometimes, you know, vertebrate fossils, there's some papers. Um, there's a really nice um, special case when people have a lot of data to test. So there's fossil problems from trees or grasses sometimes. So it's not as resolved um, taxonomically. You usually can only get down to units. But especially in North America, from uh, pollen cores from lakes, um, there's some really nice work making the model of the past, applying it to the future, uh, applying it to the now, right? Yeah. And um, seeing how well it predicts. And then vice versa, taking the current uh, record uh, applying that to the retrojective climate and kind catching where those species should have been. Um, so that can be done. We also have another advantage. Think about a disadvantage of the future. What is one kind of uncertainty in a future projection of climate? Right. So, for example, you know, bubbles uh, in 
we know how much carbon dioxide there was at those times in the past. And uh, we don't know, right? We have, that's why we have uh, projections for different emissions scenarios. Uh, so that's one kind of uncertainty that we don't have to deal with in the past. Okay. And so these also are tremendously complex, even worse than this climate. Um, and so IPCC is one place uh, where you can find a lot of information. Um, there are some regional climate models. Surely there are uh, regional climate uh, models uh, with bioclimatic data for the future for Europe, right? Anybody know off the top of their head where they take their future climate data? So the global ones are so computationally intensive that what, what can you say about the resolution of those? They're quite coarse, right? But if they take that coarse information and they feed it into uh, a regional model that say does kind of Western, um, Western Asia and Europe and surrounding areas, right? Then they can go to find a resolution. It's called regional climate model. So they use input from a GCM to do a finer resolution locally. Okay. And then we have the uncertainty about uh, how much uh, emissions will be in the future. So, other kinds of variables, um, alternative elevation uh, type information, um, and then uh, depth uh, below the surface, so to speak. However, we're going to have to think also about what makes sense for transfers. And again, I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but. Sometimes a variable works because it's correlated with what's really driving the system, right? And if it works, it works, right? As long as what? Elevation may work because it's correlated with the temperature, okay, right? And it may be great, and sometimes you may have better elevation data. You probably always have better elevation data than you do temperature data, right? Um, so it works uh, as long as that correlation is constant, right? And if you take, say, a model uh, for one part of Europe, say you take a model for um, a species in the Alps, right? And you want to apply it to the Pyrenees, which is substantially farther south. If you actually had temperature data, how well do you think that would change? Make a model based on temperature in the Alps, apply that to Pyrenees, what do you think? Okay, all right? Yeah, we hope so, right? But you take a model based on elevation as a surrogate from the Alps, you apply it to the Pyrenees, what do you think? And so who knows how the, what the relationship between uh, particular elevation versus temperatures in the Alps compared to that relationship in the Pyrenees? Is it the same? Or if you're at a different latitude, is it probably shifted? Yeah? So certainly, on a big, maybe this isn't a dramatic enough example, but if you have um, you know, a very large latitudinal range, like imagine the northern Andes compared to the southern Andes, a thousand meters, or 1,500 meters, say, uh, has a very different climate at, at the equator than it does in the middle of Chile. Okay? So that uh, correlation may work locally, uh, but it doesn't work across a larger scale. Okay? And that's also the reason why I want you guys to think about if you have this relationship between temperature and precipitation, so you're making a model uh, between temperature and elevation. You make a model now, right? And it works great, but you project it to 2050. What do you think about that? In the same region, but just at different times. Yeah, so temperature presumably will change there. How much is elevation going to change in 50 years? Right. So the correlation breaks. Okay, so when we're doing correlative models, we may not be using a driver, and that's okay as long as the correlation is constant across our study region, and we don't project it to any region where that correlation breaks. Okay? All right. 
So Chris will talk more about the marine environment. Uh, this is more elevational data. Um, but yeah, there is some amazing elevation data from the space shuttle, for example. So if you want to give uh, pictures on top, um, even if they're so fine, you can't use them for the model. Um, there's some really great, I think, 90 meter worldwide data for elevation. Uh, and then you can do these 3D maps. You can, like, you can even do videos, like movies that you can have. <laughs> no, it's really cool. Um, the way to get your, yourself on the cover. That sounds good, right? Okay. Um, so she has some more sources of where to start to look for things. Um, and overall, you all need to know the species you're working with and to what degree do you think that uh, human, um, human intervention is similar across your study region, similar across the times when your occurrence data were collected, now, do you need to use a mask to mask out some areas? Do you need to cook, uh, do the cookie cutter afterwards? Do you want to uh, put some of those variables in as predictors and make sure you match the records to the correct year for your satellite information? Um, so unless the, you're comfortable saying that these kind of issues are homogeneous across your study region, then you have to think about it. Um, so there's simple things like this human impact um, you know, index, but then there are all kinds of remotely sensed variables. So one thing important in this field is make friends uh, with someone who's a real specialist on GIS to help you through the headache. But another is even harder is make friends with a remote sensing person. Okay. All right, and uh, so she wants to thank you. And these are pictures of Sada. He's a, a paleontologist who has um, done a lot of these the work um, across time periods. So she, for example, worked with fossil hyenas um, and has uh, prepared those with projections of, of current nature of the species. And now she's gotten them to future projections. So this is her on the Okay. Um, now I think what we're going to do is switch uh, the camera and go on to the second part of environmental data. Okay.